Hello and welcome to the online ministry of New Westminster Christian Reformed Church. We hope that today's message will be a word of encouragement for you from our Lord Jesus Christ. If you would like to contact our church or our pastors, please visit our website at nwcrc.ca. May God bless you. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be together. My name is Andrew. If you don't know me, um, I serve alongside June and Zion as pastor here. And on this Thanksgiving Sunday, we uh, have this wonderful privilege of meeting in the presence of God and extending our thanks to him. And we're going to on that occasion. So we've been going through Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. We skipped over a section and are coming back to it now uh, in chapter 1. And I'd like to read the first nine verses with you. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes, To the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge, God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thus far, our reading from God's word. It's appropriate for us to consider this part of Paul's letter, the Thanksgiving section, on this Thanksgiving weekend. Most of Paul's letters begin with a Thanksgiving section, though not all of them. And when you read through that section carefully, you will begin to see how it already tells us a lot about the letter that Paul is writing. And so as we listen to how Paul invites the Corinthian church to give thanks, how Paul himself gives thanks, and as we listen to that, then we too are able to think about our thanksgiving and the way in which we acknowledge our gratitude to God. And here's how I'd like to begin. You noticed I read the first few verses before uh, the Thanksgiving section proper, which is verses four through nine. I wanna begin by just observing with you something we see in throughout these first nine verses. And that is this, Paul invites us to notice the God-centered focus that he has in this part of the letter. Going right back to verse 1, Paul's own identity is first and foremost rooted in God's calling on his life. Paul, he says, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. Imagine if all of us thought of ourselves the same way. Sarah, called to be an elementary teacher of Jesus Christ. Or Stephen, called to be a construction worker of the Lord Jesus. Or Peter or Mary, called to be a banker, a painter, a therapist, a mother, a father of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul roots his identity and calling in God And he reminds the Corinthian church that they too are those who've been sanctified by God and called to be his holy people. So immediately, Paul brings this God-centered focus 
into his letter and into their lives. And it continues in verses 4 through through 9, doesn't it? I thank God for you, he writes, because why? Well, because of his grace given you in Christ. Because of how God has enriched you in every way. For the spiritual gifts that you have received in abundance. For God's preserving grace that will keep you firm. And for God's fellowship that he's brought you into through his son, Jesus our Lord. This God-centered focus that we observe brings us, I dare say, to a first lesson that we can infer from our text. The fundamental identity of who we are as persons should always be found in our relationship to God. Or stated another way, our central identity is found in our relationship with God. Now, that is a rather countercultural way of thinking about ourselves. Advertisers want us to think of our life in relation to the things that we have. Beer commercials want us to think of our life in relation to good looking friends and exciting parties. Clothing and cosmetic companies want us to think of our lives in relation to our appearance and our beauty. Social media companies want us to think about our lives in relation to how many friends or how many followers we have. And all kinds of parts of society invite us to think of our life in relation to our careers, what we produce, or how well-to-do we are. Now, I'm not suggesting that those parts of our lives are unimportant. Of course not. But in our text and throughout the Bible generally, we're called always back to first principles. What matters most, how we ought to think about the fullness of our lives, is that we belong to God. Our central identity is found in relationship with God. That's the first thing that we notice about our passage, Paul's God-centered focus. The second thing that we notice is how Paul thanks the Lord for God's generous provision. Paul thanks the Lord for God's generous provision. He begins by saying, thanks be to God for the grace that's been given you in Christ Jesus, and continues by saying how thankful he is to God for how your lives have been enriched in every way. Now, when Paul's writing to the Corinthian church, undoubtedly he has very specific things in mind when he thinks of this grace and this enrichment of God, and we're going to see that in a moment. But on this Thanksgiving weekend... We do well, I think, to pause and consider our own thankfulness for God's grace and for his enrichment in our lives. And in order to do that, I want to take a little bit of a tangent. I want to take us out of our text specifically and share with you something that I was struck by this week. Yes, This week, as I was making my way through a new book, a rather large book, called Biblical Critical Theory, How the Bible's Unfolding Story Makes Sense of Modern Life and Culture. Now, some of you are thinking that sounds like a rather dull title, but actually this is a a delightful book. And though I'm only 100 pages into it or so, in one of the early chapters where the author talks about the Bible's account of creation found in Genesis 1, I came upon something that wasn't new per se, but fresh. Fresh enough that I wanted to share that with you on this Thanksgiving Sunday. Genesis 1 starts with that phrase, in the beginning God. And We read it typically, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And of course that's true. 
But in the Hebrew, that phrase has a kind of distinctiveness about it, just the way it's structured. In the beginning, God. He created the heavens and the earth, is how we could might read that more literally. And by beginning that way, the Bible says something that really is utterly unique among all kinds of other religious literature about the origins of the world. The Bible says that before anything existed, there was God. It presents God as being completely distinct and separate from the created world. He's in no way dependent on the created world. He's in no way bound to the material world. In fact, he is its source. Whereas the cosmos had a beginning, God always was and is and will be. God as creator is distinct from creation. Now, why is that important? Well, there are a number of reasons why, but in the book that I just mentioned, the author Christopher Watkins mentions one that, that caught my attention. He writes, we live in a gratuitous universe. And what he means by that is we live in a universe that is not necessary. God did not have to create it. God did not create it in order to satisfy something in him that was incomplete. He does not need the universe to fulfill him in some way. And that means neither the universe nor us are necessary. Listen to what Watkins says. It is through grace that a Christian is born again, but it's also through grace that the universe is born in the first place. Now, you might say, Andrew, that's not all that fresh. Well, let me expand. In ancient philosophy, like in the writings of Aristotle and others, God is presented as first cause or unmoved mover, to use the language of Aristotle. And the argument from a philosophical standpoint goes very simply like this. The world exists. Something that exists can't come out of nothing it must have a cause, and so there must be God or first cause. Now, in that way of thinking, God, as it were, becomes necessary. Necessary in order to effect or create what exists. Necessary because the world exists, it had to come from somewhere, and of course, that somewhere is God. But in the Bible, there is something even more fundamental about God than that he is a necessary first cause. I like how one writer gets at it. He says, quote, the core of the doctrine of creation is not the fact that the world came into existence, but that it did not need to that it did not need to. Everything about God's creative work is pure gift. That's what I found as being fresh. That means that our most basic posture of living in relation to God is that of praise and thanksgiving. For everything about this world, about our lives, is pure gift. And that's actually the opposite, in some sense, of many of the world's religions. In many of them, we as human beings are in a kind of bartering relationship with the gods. We sacrifice something that the God might want and we hope to get some benefit from them in return. It's a kind of a trading relationship. I give, you give. 
And if you think about that, take the gods out of the picture altogether. Consider our culture where many people would consider themselves irreligious or secular. Take the gods out of the picture and you'll see that the way many people in our day live their lives is not that different. We are taught that we are producers and consumers. We produce in order to consume. We, we sacrifice. We work hard. We give in order to get. The more I sacrifice, the harder I work, the more I can consume, the fancier the clothes are that I can buy. You don't need any sense of God or gods like the ancient religions of the world. Maybe in our culture, some might think of the market as a little g god. Watch the evening news and we're always talking about the market. Is it up? Is it down? Is it happy? Is it sad? If the market's good, then your life will be better. So we're led to believe. But you get my sense? This is the basic bartering relationship of the ancient religions of the world packaged for the West that doesn't believe in any God. I give, I sacrifice, I work hard, and I get. But it's altogether different when we recognize the graces that God has given us, when we recognize the many ways that he's enriched our lives, as Paul says. When we appreciate the very fact that God's creation did not need to take place, but takes place purely as gift, takes place because of God's abundant generosity, because of his selfless act of love to share out of his abundance with others because of a cosmic hospitality that God desires to see others at the table of the Lord, as we will experience in a few moments. Because of this cosmic hospitality, our lives have this basic posture of thanksgiving and praise. We're invited to wake up every morning, and as we begin the day, perhaps in our quiet time with the Lord, to thank him for another night's rest, for protection in our homes, for the air that we breathe, for the sweetness of the strawberries on our cereal, for the beauty around us, for the relationships that are part of our lives, for health, for strength, for sustenance and encouragement, Again and again and again, our lives take on a posture of praise and thanksgiving because everything that we experience is pure gift. Paul writes, and now I'm coming back from this tangent, I thank God for every grace that he has given you and for how he has enriched you in every way. And so today, with Paul, we thank God for his generous provision as we're reminded of how so much in our lives is, at its most basic level, pure gift. That brings us to the third part of Paul's thanksgiving for the Corinthian church. He gives thanks for God's generous supply of spiritual equipment. God's generous supply of spiritual equipment. Here's what we mean by that. Now Paul is beginning to get at some of the things that he's going to be writing about later in the letter. More specifically, some of them we've encountered, but some we will still encounter later on in the letter. We already know that many of the new believers in Corinth came out of a background that had this kind of idolatry towards wisdom, right? Wisdom including cleverly crafted rhetoric that was in its own way a sign of spiritual maturity or was used to bring you closer to God. 
Paul reminds them that they, through the power of the Holy Spirit, have already been enriched with all kinds of speech, he says, and with all knowledge. He goes on to say, you don't lack any spiritual gift. He's going to write more about that, especially in chapters 12 through 14, but he wants to say, God has graciously given you, the Corinthian church, all the spiritual equipment that you need. You don't need to look for it in the wisdom of the world. God has graciously given you all the spiritual equipment you need in order to live out the calling that God has for you until the Lord Jesus returns. Let me try to make this as practical as possible. But before, we must notice that all of the words you in our passage are in the plural. Y'all, the southerners would say. And that's important. In chapter 12, Paul is going to use the analogy of a human body to describe the church. Just, just like that human body has all kinds of different parts that must work together and that support each other, so it is with the church, with you, the Corinthians. God has given this body a generous supply of spiritual equipment. Each of you have been given a gift that is part of this healthy, functioning body. And to make that as practical as possible, this morning, we prayed for Ellie, gave thanks for her new diagnosis, prayed for comfort as she mourns the loss of a sister. We prayed for Florence. Each of them, on Friday and on Saturday, called the church and asked for prayer. Florence, feeling unwell, struggling with back issues, called and said, I need the spiritual gifts of the church in prayer to sustain me. Ellie saying, thanks be to God for the spiritual gifts of prayer that were offered for me as I was struggling with cancer. Please uphold my family. You see, we call upon the spiritual gifts of the church and experience them in a variety of ways. Sometimes in the life of a Christian, we can feel very alone. We're going through a season in our life where we're challenged, where we experience a significant setback or disappointment. And we might wonder, do I endure this alone? No. You're never alone. There is a generously supplied family with the spiritual equipment that we need who can walk with us and encourage us no matter what. And we need to remind ourselves of this, especially in a culture that praises radical individuality, right? Praises the self-made person. No. We need each other for, for guidance, for discernment, for financial support at times, for encouragement, for prayer, for mercy. Maybe you're a new Christian and God has brought you into this body of Christ, this family, so that you can be mentored, so that you can be taught, so that you can be encouraged, and so that others can model for you the Christian life. Paul says, we have been generously supplied with the spiritual equipment that's necessary for us to live our lives until the Lord returns. And that brings us to a fourth and a final observation that we can make from this passage. What we're going to call God's glorious guarantee. Paul is thankful for God's glorious guarantee. Now, we don't find the language of guarantee explicitly in our text, but I'm drawing our attention now to the phrase, God will keep you firm. God will keep you firm. The original word in the Greek is, is actually a legal technical term for 
for guaranteeing something or for furnishing security, a technical term. God is with you. God is for you. God is upholding you to the very end. And as you trust him, Paul would say, as you trust him, as you commit to him, you can be certain that God will carry you to the finish line. In fact, he uses a running analogy later in the passage. This promise keeps us firm to the end. And I dare say it is a tremendous assurance of the Christian faith. A tremendous assurance of the Christian faith. There are many people, religious people, who live without that sense of assurance. My life is in God's hand no matter what. You could ask most Muslims about whether they're certain that they will go to paradise when they die. And most often they'll simply say, I trust in his mercy. In other words, I don't really know, but I hope so. That's not the case for Christians. Paul gives thanks to God because he is keeping them firm to the end. He, as it were, is, is guaranteeing that they will be carried to the finish line. Paul adds to that. And says, thanks be to God that you will be kept blameless until that day. You see, on the basis of what Jesus has accomplished for us, entering human history, taking on our flesh and blood, uniting himself with us, on the basis of what Jesus has done, removing sin from us, paying the price for sin and removing it, the psalmist says, as far as the east is from the west. Declaring us holy and righteous. As God looks to us, he sees his son. Blameless, holy. We have been declared righteous in his sight. Listen to what Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, verses 33 to 34. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? He's talking about us. Those who have committed their lives to Christ, been baptized in the life of Christ. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It's God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. This Lord Jesus, who's sitting at the right hand of God, invites us to commune with him at his table this day. To know as surely as we take in our mouths the cup and the bread that his blood was shed for my forgiveness. His body was given so that my body, given over to the punishment of sin and death, so that my body can be raised to life. As surely as we participate in this sacrament, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we're drawn into the presence of this Jesus at the right hand of God in a way that we can't fully understand. Indeed, this is God's gracious gift for us. This is the way that God has provided a glorious guarantee. Listen to what one writer says. Our hope is rooted in the fact that we serve a God more relentless than even our own sin. A God who is patient and kind, who flat out will not let us go. So through it all, through the horrible Corinthian mess and through far less dramatic messes in places like our various congregations, the love of God keeps getting sent out, keeps getting received, end quote. This is God's glorious guarantee for us, his people. And so all of us are invited on this Thanksgiving weekend 
to reflect on how it is that our lives are called to be God-centered, knowing that he has generously provided everything about life is firstly gift, gift to us. He's given us generously of all the spiritual equipment that we'll need and provided us with a glorious guarantee. Perhaps in the coming days, we might think of concrete ways to express our thanks to God, whether it's incorporating prayers of thanks regularly into our daily quiet time, writing them down, expressing thanks to others for things that they've done via a card or some way, but ensuring that as you begin each day, you recognize you've been called by God, called into new life with him. And from that calling echoes a life full of thanksgiving and praise. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.